Hey, what's up, everybody? Matt Holmes here with BodySynergyTraining.com and another awesome, kick-ass, knowledge dropping bombs interview here with a feature with uh, Paul Paul Carter, the creator of Lift Run Bang, which is awesome. If you haven't been there, check it out. Uh, it's Lift-Run-Bang.com. He's also the author of Strength Life Legacy base building and lift run bang 365 which are all on amazon for kindle and then he also as you can see uh, here in a second the shirt he's wearing he's got some awesome shirts merchandise great articles if you haven't you're missing out check out his website um so again thanks paul for taking the time i know it's taking us some time with uh, getting this together because you're so busy with everything you're doing so i appreciate it oh it's my pleasure man thanks for having me all right, yeah, I'm, I've, I've been excited for it because, you know, as I keep telling you, I've been following you for a while from when I was in Iraq and doing this, doing that. You know, I still always tell you I miss the little podcast you guys do. That was always kind of the highlight of my week. Even though portions of it were only about training, it was still hilarious, all the other shit you guys talked about. So I miss it. Hopefully it comes back again. Um, and I think they're still out there for other people to listen to, right, for the past episodes? Yeah, there's still some podcasts out there that you can go uh, listen to that Jay had an idea. And then later, Jay Neary came on. There's actually one uh, where we have uh, Tony Sanicandro, the guitarist from Job for a Cowboy, that's never been released. And Jamie actually gets drunk halfway through the, uh, the podcast and actually passes out and doesn't even finish the podcast. And I, we just never put it out there, but I've still got it, and I'm, I'm probably going to end up releasing it this week. I'm going to give Jamie a heads up about that. So it's pretty funny. That's cool. That's awesome. That, that I'll, you'll have to let me know. I'll take a look for that and watch out for it then. So um, kind of dive in. You know, We went over some of the questions briefly. Um, I really kind of want to start with for people to really get to know you and more of what you stand for that haven't been following you because I love just you know your philosophy with – and I know you're friends with you and – Wendler and Peg, you guys kind of all have this this philosophy, especially with you and Wendler. It's very similar of just lifting and being fucking badass at life and not a pussy, really. Um, so kind of can you give everybody a little bit of a background history for you, your life in the gym, and kind of how it all started from where you were and where you are now? Um, I actually got started lifting because uh, when I was 14, I uh, went out to Albany, Oregon to uh, lift the martial artist the guy I was going to take martial arts from. And I actually lived with his parents for the whole summer, and he was my martial arts instructor. But he would uh, he would come get me, take me to the gym. He's the guy that actually got me started. And I was a really really little guy. I mean, I was well under 100 pounds at that time, and I think I was about 14. And uh, uh, pretty much it just took. I mean, once I got home, I left I left Oregon and I went back to Mississippi and I got home and uh, I just never quit training. So, I mean, that, that's pretty much how everything got started. And for the first, um, I don't know how many years, probably the first 15 years of my training or so, the first 12 years, I did mostly like bodybuilding stuff. And because we, at the time, the only thing I wanted to do was get bigger. And like most guys, you end up suffering, suffering from like not body dysmorphia. No matter how big you get or whatever, you always see yourself as that little bitty guy. So no matter how big I got, I just wanted to get bigger. I mean, that's obviously the focus of what bodybuilding is. Um, it wasn't until about maybe 10 years ago uh, that I really started more focusing on the powerlifting side of things. I mean, there's obviously a carryover back and forth. Uh, if you're training for bodybuilding, you're still training stronger, but it's it's within a higher rep range. And that's how most of my training uh, was. It was basically centered around the same kind of principles that Dory Gates training around, you know, pushing heavier and heavier weights at higher and higher rep ranges. But as it, um, as I realized, I mean, I was never going to do a bodybuilding competition, and I started getting more involved in the strength side of things. My training started shifting over into more powerlifting stuff. And uh, over the last decade plus, I started developing more um, basically training methodologies and, and things like that, devoted uh, to just getting stronger. So that's kind of uh, the evolution of my training. Over the course, I mean, high level standpoint of my training over like the last twenty five years. Okay. Okay. Cool. Perfect. Yeah, and that's that's kind of it's 
I'm sure both of those backgrounds have played a an influence to kind of where you are now and kind of how you do some of your coaching and within your programs where they're largely strength based, obviously, because you are doing a lot of the powerlifting stuff now and all the stuff that I see of you, you know, and the weights you're pushing around. But, I, you know, like I said, there's that carryover as well. So I'm sure both of those have played a huge influence in you know, what you're doing now and then kind of the programs and the things that you teach other people. Um, as I was saying too, is one of the reasons that, you know, stood out for me wanting to get this interview with you is your whole kind of training and philosophy with life and how, you know, all of us that are big into, you know, meatheads that are in the gym all the time, we, everybody try, it finds the correlation of how, the things you learn in the gym and under the bar transmit everywhere across your life. It's if anything, for a lot of us, like for me coming from a hardcore drug background and getting into the gym, it got me away from that and taught me a lot of stuff that I know now. So kind of how, how did your training philosophy come about and evolve with the whole lift run bang? Well, that's a, there's a couple of loaded questions there. Um, <laughs> Number one, if we're talking about the whole, I've always found parallels between life and lifting, and I think that can overlap between a lot of different ideologies and philosophies. I mean, most of us go through different struggles in our life, and most of us, you know, we're going to go through different uh, triumphs. And we're going to grow and learn, uh, basically. I mean, just as human being, and I don't see the, to me the way to represent that a lot of times. You're chasing a number, or you're chasing a number, or you're trying to get bigger, or whatever it is. There's always a hurdle that you're trying to overcome in terms of uh, getting better in this gym. And oftentimes, you find such parallels in regards to that to life, whether it be your job or a relationship that you're in, or something that you're going through with a, uh, a family member or anything like that. You talk about coming from a you know, drug background. My sister was an addict, and I had a lot of years of trying to deal with things that she was going through. And so I think the thing is, is that I just often find that there's a, always a way to correlate the two things is basically the struggles that you find in life often have a parallel to the struggles that you find in the gym. Things that, you know, disappoint you or things that make you feel lesser or things that make you feel better. I mean, I can remember being very young, more than anything in the world, so badly just wanting to be bigger and stronger nothing happened for extended periods when I was training very hard, you know, eating until I felt like I wanted to throw up. And I can remember having days where I was, you know, at the time all I had was bodybuilder magazine. So I can remember having um, days where I would literally tag up all those bodybuilder magazines and put them in a trash bag and throw them out the fucking door. And, you know, those are times when the will gets tested. I mean, those are the times where you have to ask yourself how badly do you really want something when it's not coming easy um when you're having to work you know exponentially harder for it than you would think you'd have and uh, a lot of times in life we get in those same situations is that things don't always come very easy and we have to work a lot harder than we feel like that we should have to for something and we have to make choices at those times and decide whether or not we're going to continue on and push through or whether or not we're and take a different, a different path in life. And luckily for me, I wanted it bad enough to keep at it. But I see a lot of people that you know, they think they want something. And, you know, at first they're always very excited. I had a, a talk with a friend of mine a couple of weekends ago at a meet. And he was going to switch over and actually do bodybuilding. He was tired of being heavier, he was tired of feeling bad. He wanted to do the bodybuilding show with your rip and get shredded. And, and do all those things. And at first, you know, he was so excited about it. He was um, so enamored with making this change in his life. And every week that went got went by, that excitement waned a little bit and that enthusiasm to do that way a little bit because he doesn't to die. You know, he was used to eating what he wanted, you know, he was happy. And eventually he decided that he didn't want to do that. And I mean that's kind of that encompasses a lot of things that we go through in life is that at first the idea sounds really phenomenal and really resonates. And then after a while, 
all the things that you have to do to make that idea come to fruition, it feels too hard. And you put it to the wayside. And you say, well, I, I tried that. That was too hard. That's why gyms are filled up at the first of the year with 42,000 fucking people. And six weeks later, it's always the same assholes in the gym that are going to be there for the other, you know, 48 weeks of the year. So people always have these ideas of, you know, grandeur, I'm going to get this, get that. And, you know, I, I wrote a while back and I, I, had, I actually had to revise this term because I, I made that video about sacrifice and a lot of people saw that video. But before that, I wrote um, a little thing and I said, you have to decide what you want, what you would sacrifice for. But later I realized, you know, that, that term has to be redefined because sacrifice is more about what you're willing to give up that you want for someone else for the betterment of their life. Where getting better for something that you want um, isn't really about sacrifice, it's a little more self-serving. But you do have to realize um, basically it's what you want and the effort that you're willing to give for, it, which is a little bit better philosophy. And that's what a lot of people don't realize is they, they go to travel down a path and they're filled with, you know, oh, I'm, I'm going to get to the end and I'm going to look like I want, I'm going to feel like I want. But there is some relationship that they've just met this person. I mean, how many times do you see on Facebook when you, you see two people first get together and every fucking status is about how they're the greatest person in the world. And their life is finally fulfilled and then three months fucking later, I can't stand this asshole or, well, I, I, I was in the gym for the last couple of months, but I got too busy. And everybody seems to get too busy quitting. And that's what happens a lot of times. Because when things get hard, you know, it tests your will. It tests your resolve. And that's what it's there for. Those those walls and those roadblocks are there to help you make a decision. Okay, do you, do you really want to get over this and become something better? Because it won't be easy. So that's a lot of basically how I end up drawing a lot of those parallels uh, between lifting and life. Because lifting is, is about resistance. And life is about resistance too. It's just a different kind of resistance. I mean, in the gym, you build people strength in your body. And life, when it offers you resistance, if you get better from it, then it builds strength in your character, it builds strength in your integrity, it builds strength in, in all the, the qualities that should make you a better person. The problem is that doesn't happen with all of us because a lot of us let uh, bitterness and negativity. Um, and association with bad things that have happened to us, uh, those things start to rule the day or start to overtake us, and that becomes a part of the fun. The thing is, is that we get a choice. A lot of people don't, they don't want to make a choice. They don't, they don't realize, if they want to stay bitter about something, then it's their choice to stay bitter. They, if they want to get better through adversity, then they can. But it's all about your experiences and your association and stuff and how you let that transform who you are and what you're about. So, I mean, that's a lot of the things that I end up writing about often. Um, as far as how, interesting story, how the entire blog came about was, uh, I was uh, I was emailing Jim Wendler, and we would talk back and forth, and we talked back and forth for a long time. And we had this one email that we, we never created a new email when we talked, but we just replied to this one email for, I don't know, like a year. And we would never create a new email. It was just something funny we could do this. And there's a one email I asked because there were like 1,700 replies in this one email. So there's no new email. There's one email between Jim Wendler and myself that exists pretty much. And it's just got like 1,700 replies. And I decided to, because we discussed training ideas so much, I decided to, well, I was going to start the blog, but I didn't start it for any reason other than just to have a private place to be right. I didn't, it wasn't about, oh, I'm going to write this blog and I want a million people to come read it or anything like that. It was just a private place for me to write my training thoughts and maybe to keep a journal and those kind of things. Because I got off message support because it was just full of the dredges of the literature as far as I can. So um, I started writing and I would send Jim my, what I wrote and he liked it uh, and asked me if I would be interested in having uh, Elite FPS publishing. I was I had a lot of trepidation about that at the time because you know, uh, you know, just like anybody else, I was a nobody. I hadn't accomplished anything. We still haven't accomplished anything, honestly, of noteworthy as far as my lifting on the platform because uh, 
the last few weeks I've had, I've over, I got injured both times, and obviously I'm not making any excuses. That's just what happened. So I sent that to Jim, and uh, I told him that uh, I finally made a decision. Yeah, go ahead and, and publish it. And so uh, he did, and it was met with you know good reception. And then um, I was asked to do you know a multiple series on the training stuff, and I ended up doing that. And you know, it just kind of things just kind of took off from there, and I started getting a lot of hits, you know, a lot of people writing in. And over the course of the last four years, it's gone from literally just a, a little training blog where I write some stuff to you know, I do seminars now. Um, I do a lot of online coaching. Um, I have an article coming out, uh, another article coming out for teenagers in the next couple of weeks. So, I mean, that's writing is my passion. I mean, I love listening. But really, writing is my passion. I get a lot of people ask me, like, they want to do the same thing. Like, they, how, how do I, how do I start a blog and get all this attention or whatever? Well, I never, never set out for that at all. That was never my intention in any way, shape, or form. And I always tell people the same thing: you have to have a passion for writing. The writing part has to be number one. I mean, that's that's the reason why Jamie's blog does so well too. I mean, he's a great writer. I mean, you you have to be able to write something that can resonate with people. Obviously, Jamie writes in a completely different style and a different kind of way than I do and about different kinds of stuff than I do. But Jamie's obviously a great writer uh, and I respect the writing a ton. And um, I mean, that's the thing that you have to have if you're going to, if your vehicle for something is going to be video, like I, I suck at making videos. I'm terrible at doing that shit. Like I, like I, I rarely put up like a YouTube video because I, I, I'm just terrible at that. Um, but if you're going to have a specific vehicle that you want to get used to get your message across, then you have to have a passion for that part of it. You, I mean, if, if you're going to make videos, you're fucking good at making videos. If you're going to write, you need to have a passion about writing. However it is that you choose to connect with people or resonate with people, you need to have a passion for that particular thing. And I always tell guys that. And that's why a lot of guys can't follow through with that. Because, I mean, I literally write all day for the most part. Uh, I'm always writing something, whether, you know, it's, you know, something to get a rise out of somebody on Facebook or whether it's with a blog or whether it's something for T-Nation or whether, you know, whether it's for some other publication. Uh, I mean, writing has become, um, you know, my biggest passion in life. So, I mean, that's that's the part that you have to understand. If you've got a medium to get through to people, be good at that part. I don't mean that you can be a totally shitty lifter. Although I see lots of guys that are shitty lifters that get a lot of attention now because, you know, they're controversial. And I can laugh at that and appreciate it. But um, I think there was a guy who was taking shots at everybody. I can think of who took shots at, uh, uh, I don't even want to say his name, so he was, such a, he was taking shots at, at Mark Bell, and he was taking shots at Chad Wesley Smith and Juggernaut and all sorts of things. If that's what, um, I think a lot of guys do that because that is a way their name out there. It's like, let me go after some big name people. And then somebody sees that and they say, oh, look, um, this guy's taking some shots at me. And that's a way, that's kind of a shitty and cheap way, I think, to, to get your name out there. But, you know, if people are going to watch you and you're going to do that stuff, at least fucking be funny. So, and I laugh. So I guess he's doing his job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you didn't even before you kind of really got into this writing like i know a lot of people are going to think like oh well i suck at videos or i suck at writing like i know i'm not the greatest writer but as i write more and more and like i journal every morning i have my morning routine and like just write my own shit that i want to talk about and now it's like getting in where i'm just like oh let me think of this and i you know start writing shit down or i have an idea it kind of i enjoy it because i like just getting my thoughts out kind of like you and then just helping people and people are like, Oh, I really loved that. What you had to say, like I wrote an article the other day on like setting goals, you know, and it was like, I think nine or 10 steps that ended up being, I had that in my mind. And then I woke up and it was like five in the morning. I'm like, fuck it. And I just started writing and people are like, Oh, that was really great. I'm like, Oh, okay. I thought I was kind of a shitty writer, but it, I guess it's, you didn't start as like a great writer. It kind of just evolved as you wrote more and more, right? It's not like you just came out with like, oh, I'm great at writing and boom, it happens like everybody kind of thinks. Well, actually, you know, I broke my teeth in writing several years ago and um, I was going to write my first novel. I've never written anything. And I, uh, I started 
writing it, and uh, I go back now and I read it, and I'm just like, this, it's like somebody threw up on the fucking paper. <laughs> and it's just unbelievably awful. And I think I've only let a couple of people read it ever, and I'm, I'm actually redoing it. But, I mean, that's exactly right. When you start off, you, you don't really, you're trying to find your way, right? Because where you got, writing is a creative process. I mean, you really, it's no different than painting or playing music or anything. Well, unless you're a prodigy, when you first pick up a guitar, like, you fucking suck. I mean, nobody wants to hear that shit. Fuck, you know, put headphones into an amp so nobody can hear, you know, strumming terribly. You know, or if uh, if you're a singer, I mean, no, you know, again, unless you're a prodigy, nobody wants to hear you belting out some shit. You know, it sounds like two cats fucking. So you have to, you have to kind of find your way as you go along. I mean, you have to, it's a creative process, so you have to find kind of your own style. I mean, there are certain people that read enough books that can read a passage from an author and kind of tell you who the author is because of the style of writing. Everybody has their own style. And like lifting or like music or like, you know, anything you do in life, the more you do it, obviously, the better that you get at it. And, you know, now it's to the point where every once in a while, somebody will read an old article of mine or, or quote it up. Um, and I'll read it, or even I'll read something for myself, and I'll go, wow, did I really fucking like that? That's pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, when I go back and read some of my early stuff, and I go, Jesus Christ, why didn't somebody tell me this is all shit? You know, when you first write it, you know, you think it sounds pretty good, and that's why often you come back a couple of days later, and you look at it again, you're like, no, this could be something better. Now, if you write stuff sometimes, and I just post it up, and I don't really give a shit what it sounds like, but if it's for a major publication, I'll take the week or two out, you know, really go over it pretty well. Um, or if it's for my books, I try to um, go over that for a lengthy period of time. But, you know, writing is a creative process, and it does take a while to kind of to, uh, to find your own groove in that kind of way. But, you know, it's funny that you mentioned they get up at like 5 or 20. I often find during those early hours the same thing. Like, I sit down you know, by myself, I have my own time, I drink my coffee, and I can write for hours. Uh, and it just feels good. It's a, it's, it's a definitely, there's a definitely a, uh, a kind of a decompression that happens there with the rest of the world. You kind of tune everything out and you just kind of get in your own little zone and write that. So, um, yeah, I mean, you just have to, um, figure out how much you enjoy that process because for a lot of people, it's, you know, it's a painstaking process to sit down and write an article. Anytime I've ever done an article for a major website, um, they always limit, tell me, well, it's a limited number of words, and I always write about four times that many words. So if they're like, you know, a thousand words, it always ends up being 4,000, and I shrink as best I can. I'm like, hey, this is what you got. And they're like, okay. So, I mean, that's, but again, that's because I love writing, and some people that want to convey a message, they, they want to, um, you know, find a way to get their stuff out there. They don't love the writing aspect. They don't love the creative process. And without that, you know, it's like anything that you do that you're not passionate about, you're not probably not going to get very far. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, and I'm thinking too of like the correlation with some of that of back to lifting again is, you know, everybody starts pretty much at the same point when they step into a gym. Like you're not going to be benching or deadlifting all this crazy. You're not going to move really well. You're starting somewhere and you got to keep improving and improving and improving from there. And then you might be really great or it just might be something you enjoy for yourself. You know, like people just like writing and journaling for themselves or like us, we kind of, we like writing and putting shit out there for other people. And I kind of remember like when I first, my old, old website that I started before I went into the military and everything like that, I, I just said, fuck it. And just started writing. I'm like, I don't care if it sucks. Like I got to start somewhere. Everybody was telling me just start writing. So I was like, okay, you know, whatever I thought of started writing and it kept improving and improving. And then that's when I came up with like the motivation Mondays, you know, certain things would happen or I'd think of this or I'd see a quote and start writing people were like, Oh, that's one of my favorite things. I look forward to it every morning that you're getting your posts. So kind of like when I stopped doing that, just like if you stop lifting, you're going to lose some of the, what you gained. It kind of happened that way with me when I started writing again. I stopped, didn't think about it, was just doing what I was doing in the Middle East, everything I did. And then I was like, okay, now let me get back into writing because I miss it. 
it was kind of a slow process getting in. And like, yeah, you said, I used to, I've read some of my old stuff. I'm like, I fucking wrote this. Like, no, this isn't me. And I'm reading, I'm like, who wrote this? Oh, I wrote this article. Like, I don't even remember that. So yeah, I think it's kind of the same with lifting. I say it's just, it's a, it's a creative process or training is can, it's still creative process in a different way. It just takes time, you know, and it's just finding what you enjoy to do and putting the time into it with, you know, life and lifting and everything from that kind of, yeah. um, uh, another thing kind of want to touch on with that too, is the whole lift run bang thing for people that are, you know, don't know the whole philosophy behind it of what it is, is kind of, how did you come up with that? And, you know, explain to some of the people of like, you know, I know reading about it when you said, you know, the lifting, the running, and then the bang aspect of it kind of, you know, ex expand on that some. Well, I mean, when I, when I first started, uh, when I actually started the blog, a lot of people may not remember this, but it was called, it was called Functional Strength. I hated that fucking term. And I wanted to, you know, because everybody fucking hates that term, functional, because nobody can ever define what functional strength is. I fucking hate it when people say, oh, I'm a functional trainer. I'm like, just fucking kill me now. Well, my whole purpose was to possibly, you know, start that and write, uh, and basically just explain that being functionally strong was simply put to be strong and be in shape. So in other words, if, if you, you know, if you are a strong squatter and a strong puller, a strong venture, a strong overhead guy, you know, but you've also, you know, you're also not a fat tub of shit. You know, that's what being functionally strong is, is that having a high level of strength development can transcend across multi platforms. So when I first started, it was called functional strength, and that was the whole key was to write about um, you know, doing a lot of, you know, like interval training or running just to be in shape, not, you know, not, um, not the stuff you see out of CrossFit. Now, I'm, I'm one of the few guys that I don't bag on CrossFit a whole lot. Um, but, you know, just being in shape, you know, so that you feel good, you know, you have a good work capacity, those kinds of things. And, but I, I, I couldn't come to terms with keeping the name as much as I hated that fucking term so much. So I ended up just, just coming up with lift, run, bang, and, and of course everybody always thinks bang is about fucking. But um, you know, and, and it can be if you want it to be. <laughs> but you know, bang was uh, it was supposed to be a variable. And uh, when a lot of people they don't understand what I mean by that, um, that's probably because I, for fifteen years I was a, a computer engineer, but when I say it's a variable, I mean it can mean anything. It can mean that, you know, you lift, condition, and then what are you doing those things for? You know, it could be because you're, you know, an MMA guy or a football player, or it could be, you know, any endeavor that you're involved in that those two things um, correlate to. So that was basically the idea behind calling it the bang. So, you know, the other part was that the bang was just related to the entire concept of talking about um, life, um, you know, uh, hardships, romance, you know, all that kind of shit too. You know, and I find it funny because um, I've, I've heard, you know, both sides uh, of things, you know, about, you know, the net is either that, either that I'm a hard ass, you know, and that um, I write too much quote unquote alpha male bullshit or that I'm a Nancy boy because um, I write a lot about uh, relationships or write a lot about those kind of things. And I'm like, make up your fucking mind. You know, either I'm a hard ass or I'm over here, you know, crying in the fucking corner like a woman that's hit by a tidal wave of estrogen. I mean, you know, you have to decide which one it is. If they say I want to be both, that's fine. I don't care about that stuff anymore. But the whole point is, is that it was supposed to be a reflection uh, of more than just what we do in the gym, more than just what we do. Uh, to build, you know, just to build our bodies, to build our strength levels, and that kind of thing. And I want it to be a bigger reflection of um, of our life, and to, to bring that kind of stuff more to the forefront. And I'm, most of my my writing has kind of ventured off into that area now, because I honestly find writing about those aspects far more interesting. I mean, there's only so much you can say about lifting anymore. And people, if you go back and get you know routines from literally from 60 years ago, I mean, the, the concepts are no different. I mean, do a general warm up for 15 minutes, you know, do five sets of five squats or whatever. I mean, 
but we know pretty much everything you know, need to know about eating big and strong anymore. There's really nothing new in the way of the programming or training methodologies or any of that kind of stuff. But life has ever evolved for everyone. I mean, everyone out there, while they're going to go through their own unique challenges and their, walk their own unique path, everybody responds to those things differently. And that's a, that's a constant moving target. And, and something that's very dynamic, something that I find a lot more interesting to write about. I think the one concept people miss is that, I mean, I'm obviously not perfect. I probably fuck up more than anybody I know. But, you know, it's kind of like you talked about, and I made this uh, this parallel before, and it's, you know, if you were a recovering addict, you're not going to be able to identify very much with the guy who's never drank a beer in his life. I mean, your experiences are going to be far different than how he lived, you know, his uh, the, the paradigm by, that his life by. I mean, it's going to be, be a big contrast. He's not really going to be able to identify with you a whole lot, and you may not be able to identify with him a whole lot in terms of the struggles that you've been through or the things that they'll come. And I think the reason why I often resonate with a lot of people when I talk about certain things that I'm either going through or struggles that I've had is because you don't have any frame of reference to write about. You know, if you don't make well, I'm not advocating making poor choices here. I'm just saying we all, we all make we all make poor choices. I will say one of my favorite sayings is a bad decision is made for great stories. But if you don't have a frame of reference for fucking something up, then how is the, the person you're trying to talk to who you see is fucking up or who you see is going through a really difficult period in your life, how are you gonna be able to relate to them? And how are they gonna be able to relate to them? You know, uh, at one of my seminars I did when I was out in Pittsburgh, you know, I had a, a young lady ask me a question about basically like that her boyfriend and her broke up, and that she couldn't get through the heartache. You know, how was she ever going to know, you know, when it was going to end or go? Well, my girlfriend of three years, when I was, from the time I was like 15 to almost 19, she left me like for another dude, like right in front of my face. Like, like, walked out of my house, last word she ever said to me was five ball. And like that, after three fucking years, it left. And for the next, next three or four months, I mean, it was, it was, it was pretty fucking hard. I mean, I cried every day. And, um, the best thing I can tell her is that the present is never permanent. You know, and I, I related that story to her. And that sometimes once, um, once the clouds lifted, or once you're able to lift, clean off that window because you know when you're emotionally invested in something, nothing's there you don't see things very clear you know it's like looking through a, a window that's you know fogged up you're trying to explain the landscape outside to someone you can't see it very well and once that fog is lifted especially if you're in, in an emotional turmoil type situation but once that fog is lifted you can explain what a, what it looks like outside you can explain the landscape because now you have proper perception. But until you have proper perception, it's, it's, you can't really do that. And without talking to someone else who's been there, you don't have any way to resonate. So I often tell people it's not about living a perfect life, not even a lot about living perfect moments. Um, everybody often gets caught up in the fact that you know, that's what life is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about being happy all the time, having a perfect life and having all your bills paid and all that kind of shit. That can be a part of life. But I know a lot of rich motherfuckers that are really unhappy. You know, and I know a lot of people that are just unhappy in general. They they don't have quote unquote perfect moments. And I know people that live paycheck to paycheck that are perfectly happy with their life and are content in a lot of ways. And my point about all of that is is that a lot of people don't realize that life is also about the the tsunami shit wave, as I often like to say, that can overtake you at times and survive and do it. I mean, how else are you going to create, you know, appreciate the really quote unquote perfect moments if you haven't survived and did things horrific, you know, in order to reflect back on the differences? So, I mean, I, I, I put myself through a lot of shit at times because 
my own decisions, which I take full accountability for. I, that's one thing I've learned over the years. Is you, you have to stop blaming other people for when you wake up that morning and you say, how the fuck did I get in this? Because that, that, that's what a lot of people wake up and realize one morning when there's a paradigm shift in their life, is that they wake up and there's there's this epiphany that you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm really, you know, in a hole right now. You know, I am really fucking far down. I'm really at rock bottom. And a lot of people go, how did I get here? Well, I think how you get there through the choices that you make. And that takes a lot of people a long time to realize that they often get a position that they are in for no other reason than they make the choices to keep there. And then obviously you have to make choices to either stay there or to get out, but not making the choice is a choice too. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, kind of with with some of that, you know, I'm thinking like, I remember I used to play the blame game on things, you know, everybody does. And a lot of people sadly still do, or, you know, I hear about it. And, you know, there'd be times where somebody, yeah, might have said they were going to do something or you were in a relationship, something happened like that. Like other people can still have a factor in that. But it, when you remove all that bullshit, it still comes down to you of like, okay, well, I could have better prepared by doing this, this, and this, or I've made this choice, you know, where I thought it, it's not necessarily that it was bad. You thought it was good at that time, but don't sit and like blame the other person. Cause you're like, okay, Hey, I made that choice, but now cause of that choice I'm here. So, Oh fuck it. Well, now what do I need to do? And you learn from it. And that's just part of life. I think we know when we're making bad decisions and we make them. Like, I don't, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think often it's not that, that old saying that, well, it seemed like a, seemed like a good decision at the time. I think that oftentimes we know and understand when we're making a decision that's going to have ramifications. I think the, the biggest problem is to lie to ourselves during those moments in order to justify our shitty behavior. So when we get to where we're like, I'm going to do this and you know, you know that there's going to be there's going to be and I always I, I write this like you know life's going to life always I don't ever feel like there's a win situation or a win win because no matter what decision you make life's going to give you something and it's going to take something away now the severity of each of those depends on the situation but I I've never been in a circumstance in my life where that didn't end up coming to fruition where if I make a choice to get something I want. I'm going to lose something else, no matter what it is. If you make a choice to buy a new car, well, you're going to lose some money. Each month. You know, I mean, there's, there's, you know, if, I mean, there's almost nothing you can think of where you, you're going to, you're going to get something in your life, and then something else is inevitably going to take away. You know, or if you give something up, there's something in return that you got. It doesn't always reveal itself at first. A lot of times it reveals itself later. But I think more often than not. When we, if, we're, if we're introspective enough about it, we know when we're making a decision that's going to take more away than it's going to give. But the thing that we want to get out of that situation is something that we want to of our own selfish reasons. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that. It's, it's good that you kind of bring that point up because, yeah, you know, I could say there's a lot of times where I was like, thought it was a good idea, but at the end it was like, I really knew this is really not that great of an idea, but I'm going to tell myself it's a good idea to do right now because of the situation or whatever it is. And, you know, again, like kind of back to the biggest thing, it's just taking responsibility. It's not like, Oh, I fucked up. I did this. And like kind of beat yourself up is, you know, you, you live and you learn from it and you just move on, you know, yeah. and that's just, that's part of life. And then kind of with another thing you were saying that made me think of, uh, you know, that bad shit just is part of life. It can't always be rainbows and flowers and unicorns all over the fucking place all the time. It's, right. it builds your character having all these different low points that everybody has. Even the richest people out there that are happy, this and that, they have their hard times and their low points, whether it's relationships or business. And it, it made me think of, you know, I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. I, I have my times where I forget those things, you know, and yeah, I have all these tattoos and all, most of them are quotes and shit. You know, I have uh, I live for, 
across my chest and people are like, what? Like, what do you live for? And I'm like, I live for like, just you name it. Like, that's just part of like the ups, the downs, the bullshit, the roller coaster. Like, it reminds me of like, hey, you know what? It's part of life. And that's what I'm here for is the ups and the downs and everything that goes with it. And I think people kind of, they, they lose that. And I lose sight of it sometimes too. You know, when I hit a low and I'm like, okay, Hey, you know what? That's just part of life. It's a challenge. It's how you are in the now, not in the future or in the past and how you're going to take that and where you're going to go from it, from that point, right then and there. Yeah. I think the one misconception there is that it's that challenges or problems don't build character. And that's, that can be the case. I think more often than not, it actually just reveals your character. So and that's kind of what I was getting back to before is that sometimes the bad times bring out worse in, in some people. And then there's sometimes it brings out the best in certain people. And that all comes back to the other concept is choices, the choices that they make um, in regards to their own actions. So when, when people go through these struggles and these trials, it, it often reveals what they're made of. Because once you strip away all the layers, and I mean, when things are great, when things are everybody gets to be awesome that that's that's not hard what you find out is, is what is someone really made of when you strip all of those layers or protective layers away uh, where people are building them up or you know or things are going great or it's got that new promotion at work and they got this praise you know or you know they're dating someone that they they think they're really in love with what happens when things get bad and all of those things that shielded you you know, from the shit storm. When all that stuff goes away, what's left underneath that? And for some people, it's, there's a very strong, um, grounded, uh, you know, person that can deal with these things and can be a rock for someone. And then for a lot of people, they crumble under that. And those kinds of people, you can use them uh, to help get stronger through resistance. You know, or you can be that person that walks into the gym you know, on, you know, there's, there's your parallel that walks into the gym uh, right after New Year's and walks out four to six weeks later because the will to overcome the hard times just wasn't strong. And for other people, they just continue to endure. So, like I said, once, once you get broken down and people see what you're really made of, sometimes things show up differently than maybe you expect or they expect. Yeah, I think that's interesting that you kind of made with that of like you everything can be perfect, but your will and your character really gets tested, not actually really when everything's great and perfect, but it's what you do when shit goes bad, you're backed into a corner. Are you just going to sit there and hunker down and play the what was me? It's like, are you going to get up and you're going to fucking push back on that resistance and that's really going to kind of show who you are, you know, or like they say, you know, looking at your friends or finding out really who you are when you're in these bad times, it's, it's up to you and it's what you do. And it kind of made me think too, of like how people can twist that and say, well, I was in this bad time and you know, now I have these friends left me. They said this and that. It's like, well, yeah, cause you, you're an asshole and you were a Debbie down or whatever. You didn't, you didn't rise to that occasion. You just kind of back down and, you were trying to bring people down to your level where they're trying to bring you up. So it's not actually their fault. Don't play, don't play the blame game again and blame these other people in situations. It all relied on you to push back and overcome like you were saying. And with some of that kind of what we were talking about too. And I think a lot of it plays in with this resistance and what you really want, whether it's in the gym or in life is uh, you know, you briefly mentioned sacrifice and I used to kind of have a negative and I think a lot of people have a negative correlation with sacrifice because like, oh, I don't want to sacrifice. It's, it's a bad thing, you know, kind of that's gone out there. And I don't think sacrifice is bad at all. And I'm sure you don't either. It's like, what do you want and what are you going to, what are you willing to do to get that? And that's what sacrifice is. You know, are you going to sacrifice not going out are you going to sacrifice not going out with your friends and having that drink or not having this instant gratification or you're going to miss this or you're going to stay up late and you might not lift as great the next day tomorrow but you know you got to get this article or this and this done but you're not going to sacrifice that and you're not going to sacrifice going to the gym like you can go on and on 
about all these scenarios, but I think sacrifice is a huge thing that people think negatively on, but it's what is going to get you to where you are or from where you are to where you want to be or not. Well, that's actually, that's kind of what I was trying to explain on earlier. See, I don't, I don't think that's sacrifice. Okay. If, if you're giving up, if you're giving up having a drink for the betterment of yourself, that's just a choice you make. That's, you're not really sacrificing something. They really go study the term because it's basically, I mean, the, the, the actual term sacrifice, if you look at it, it was basically when people gave a sacrificial atonement to God. Okay, so they gave up something they wanted to make up for something else. Okay, so some people say, well, that applies to the situation. You know, they, they gave up something that they wanted. In this case, the person really wants to get bigger or stronger, have a better body. I mean, those are the things they want. But in a sacrificial atonement, the person had to literally go kill their best animal, their best lamb, or their best you know, goat, or whatever the fuck ever. What sacrifice really is, is, is what the people around you do support you while you go on this, this journey to, you know, become a better power of the body or, you know, or a better businessman or those kinds of things. Those people are the people around you that support you, that are the closest to you. Those are the ones that end up sacrificing. For example, if, you, you know, if, your, if your wife cooks all your meals, you know, she gets them at that time. To help something better you but if you're you know because i you know people talk about well i you know it's from sacrificing my health because i'm sticking all these drugs into my body that's not a sacrifice that is something you want to do for the betterment of yourself where really what a sacrifice is is where you give up what you want more than anything to better someone else's life so the thing that we often do is we like to put ourselves up on this pedestal or you know, nail ourselves up on this cross and say, look at all I'm giving up. But you're not. You give those things up because you want something great. That's what that's for you, which in turn doesn't make it a sacrifice. And that's kind of what I was trying to get earlier. I had to rethink that word because I used to say the same thing. It comes down to what you want and what you're willing to sacrifice for. But it actually is what you want and what kind of effort that you're willing to that, that's effort. I mean, that's if you're, if you're not willing to go out and have that drink, or you're, you're not willing to stay out on the, the weekends, or whatever you want to do, but those things are self-serving. They're self-serving to you. It's you want you have a bigger vision for what you want in accordance with yourself. So if you notice the word there, it keeps coming up self. Where sacrifice is something you are giving up to someone else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Then that, that you know, it's funny. I've never really thought of it that way but it makes it makes a lot of fucking sense you know like how you made the coalition of where it really started from of you know a sacrificial thing that is your you know you're giving up or when you think of these families or you know relationships it's it really makes a lot of sense and yeah when you think about it everything else is you can say it's a sacrifice you know like oh, i'm going to give up this and this for what i want but that's really like you said, it's it's a personal choice for what you want to do. What are you willing to give up more so, not what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to give up and do to get to where you want? Or what are you willing to sacrifice this to make your partner happy or I, I to just, do I this? A, I see it as a case of just putting in work. If a guy goes to medical school and goes to medical school for 10 years, not sacrificing all that time. That's just what you have to fucking do. Yeah. When it comes to the doctor. If you wanted to, to use another term of that where he sacrificed, take a doctor, a guy gets out of medical school and goes to a third world country and lives hand to mouth along with everyone else so that way he can get them you know, medical care. Well now he's he sacrificed what it is he could you know, he could be happy. He could be, he could have a six figure income or seven figure income and be living in a big fucking house driving Mas Maseratis. You know, and banging multiple women, you know, beautiful women or stuff. But he, you know, he gives those things up maybe if he wants to to go over and work in a third, third world country. I mean, I think it, when I made that video about that, I, I think it's it was it's very shallow of us to think about the things that we do that that better our own lives as sacrifices. 
So you go talk to a guy that was, you know, in World War II or go talk to a Vietnam vet or go talk to a guy that was in Iraq or Afghanistan that doesn't have all his limbs anymore. Maybe, you know, he doesn't have part of his face or whatever. And I would dare any of these guys to go tell him how they sacrifice for powerlessness or how they sacrifice for bodybuilding or how they sacrifice for the gym. It would be, it would be quite sad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think that's the perfect example to, you know, and I was thinking about that. That's a perfect example to really explain the difference of sacrifice and, like you said, a choice for what you want is you, you can't really get any more down to the point. Like they say, that's, you know, the ultimate sacrifice is going out for your country. You, you know, I've lost friends. I've seen other people that have lost limbs and this and that. It's like, that is a, you know, people are like, oh, you choose to do that. It's like, no, you're just a fucking asshole. And I just want to punch anybody that says that. It's like, yeah, I choose to, but it is a, they don't understand the sacrifices that you gave, you know, everything you're giving for that choice to go for your country. And you might not come back home. So most people either give up their life or, you know, many other things uh, to protect our freedom. So, you know, they're, they're giving up, literally, lots of guys give up their lives in war and combat to protect our freedom. They are, they're giving up the single greatest thing they can give up for the betterment of someone else. And that's truly what sacrifice is. Nothing we do in lifting or, or the shit we do in the gym or the shit we do on the platform or on the bodybuilding stage or on a strongman, you know, uh, show or whatever. None of that shit sacrifices. We do all that stuff because we want to. You know, we, and it doesn't better anybody else's life, just for the betterment of ourselves. Yeah. Which is kind of the opposite of sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. I, and I hope a lot of people really kind of come away from, especially this portion, I think it'll help a lot of people of like, you know what, I need to step up and not think of I'm a sacrifice going out drinking. It's like, what do you want? And just make that fucking choice. And that's just a choice for yourself. It's not a sacrifice and oh, look at me, all these sacrifices I made. It's like, you didn't make any sacrifice. That's a choice. Like, it's just a choice. Yeah, I think that, that that's really a good point to kind of touch on, and I think a lot of people it will resonate with. Yeah, and a lot of people, and, and I see this a lot, is that they want to be uh, put on a pedestal for the efforts that they make to build their body. It's just ridiculous. I mean, there's, you know... That's not a big, in the grand scheme of life, it's not a big deal. I mean, it's really, uh, there's, there's single mother out there working two and three jobs, you know, at a time to provide for her kids so maybe they don't have to grow up poor. What we do is, is something that we enjoy. We, we go to lift weights because it makes us feel good, it makes us look good. Um, you know, and we're, the biggest thing, or I say the most overriding theme I have figured out in all of this shit in, in terms to do with lifting, is that the thing deep inside of each of us that stays in lifting is there's, there's really one concept that exists that we're all trying to become something we currently are not. And that's it. All of us are working and putting this in because we're trying to become something we currently aren't. So if you think about that, it doesn't sound like there's much depth there at first because it's so short. But that's really what the overriding theme is why we keep doing something else out there that we're trying to get to. Like there's, there's another level we're trying to get to. There's another, there's another bench press to draw, or there's another squat to draw, or there's another inch on your biceps or whatever. But the whole point that we continue doing this is literally just insecurity. And a lot of guys don't like to hear that, or a lot of women don't like to hear that. But it's that we're not totally content in what we are from that perspective. And that's okay. I mean, that's okay. That's a, a strong driving force uh, across, you know, any spectrum that we live in from um, your job to anything. It's that people, you know, and, you know, and I worked in the government for a long time, and there were people, I mean, they didn't care if they had to have a Bukkake fest in order to get a raise or a promotion. I mean, they would suck off as many people as possible uh, in order to move up the, the ladder. Yeah. I mean, that's you no know, different. I mean, they, they wanted to be something they currently were not, which is Bukkake people. So, I mean, that's, I mean, but at the heart of the matter, that, that's really what it all is, is that life is a lot about that. Most of us are not very content. Most of us, um, we're not ever, ever, ever going to be terribly happy, ever. 
you know, people are always looking for this utopia for them. It's not going to exist. If somebody gave you, you know, $50 million tomorrow, you'd be happy for a fucking long time. But eternally, there's lots of people that won the lottery that were broke 10 years later. Yeah. You know, it's not just about money. You know, you're never going to find the quote unquote perfect person. You know, you're never going to have perfect parents. You, you're, you're never going to be in a situation for very long. You'll be content for a while about them. But I mean, it's with lifting, it's the same way. I mean, every time that I hit a PR, I feel good for about five minutes. <laughs> I, and I literally do. I feel good for about five fucking minutes. And six minutes later, I think, well, that's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I know how I know how that feels like. Yeah, you know, I lift her. I'm looking like, yeah, you know, like I'm getting some more size on this, and then and like, and then you look again, you're like, fuck, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's not as good as I want. It, let me keep going. Yeah, and happiness is very fleeting. You know, happiness is something that's going to come and go throughout your life. You know, it's the same thing. Um, no matter what we accomplish, there's at least I haven't arrived there yet. Maybe there's some people that have. I'm sure that there's people out there that in terms of whatever their endeavors were, that they reached a point where they said, I'm happy and I'm content with what I've accomplished and I can walk away now. I mean, there's obviously guys in football that are done. But, you know, even if you, you ask a guy that, you know, won a Super Bowl and, you know, won, won a defense, defensive MVP or did all these things, he'll have moments. He's still going to have moments throughout his career where he would say, you know, I, I came up short here. You know, I, I didn't, I just didn't perform to the best of my abilities. I mean, I don't know ever in the life that you're ever going to have something that feels like complete. And I think that that's why a lot of people do remain unhappy because they don't understand that concept of the ebb and flow of um, having moments of, of happiness or having moments um, where things feel good. In contrast, but you know, things are gonna feel like shit, or you're gonna wake up and, like I said, feel like, you know, how did I get myself in this situation? So, um, I mean, that that's pretty much the ebb and flow of things. Um, I don't know that we, we ever reach a point, or at least I haven't, where you feel like that, yeah, I'm a really good fucking lifter, or I, I look exactly how I want to work, or any of those things. I used to think when uh, when I was really small, you know, going like really small, if I was just 175, I fuck, I'd be jacked. I I remember being like when I was a buck 35, like I thought if I if I get to 175, I will stop fucking traffic. You know, like, I mean, that's people are gonna see me and jaws are gonna drop. And I got to 175, and that shit never happened. <laughs> and you know, the same thing. I I remember thinking if I get you know 205, I get 205 that's over 200 pounds. I'm over 200 pounds, that's fucking big. If I'm 205, I'll be fucking huge. I got the 205, and I didn't feel fucking huge. And then I got the 220, and I didn't feel huge. And I got the 240, and I didn't feel huge. And I got, now I'm 280, and I still don't feel big. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's also kind of part of life, too, is like there's always, you know, like when I have clients or when I tell them, I'm like, you know, set, set your goals now, but no, once you get there, we're going to set more. You know, there's always going to be life is just a continual progression. You don't just get somewhere and say, cool, great, great. You know, it's like you don't just set up a business and, hey, cool, great, and you just fucking leave it. Or you're not going to all of a sudden hit these records, whether, you know, or win a, a Mr. Olympia, whatever it is, you know, be the world record holder in, you know, something in a powerlifting meet. You're not just going to get there and just stay there. You know, it's a progression. Well, I love that show Breaking Bad so much because you got to see over five seasons. I don't know if you ever watched Breaking Bad. Yeah. Yeah, but you be all five seasons. <laughs> yeah, I watched every episode. <laughs> okay. That is the thing I love about that show was because the evolution of the character of Walt, both Walt and Jesse, but especially the evolution of Walt, who went from a guy that was just going to cook up a few batches of meth so a sandwich would be okay to, you know, like that slow evolution of the character through every season where he got you know, it engulfed him more and more and more and totally took over his life in every way. And it got to a point where it had nothing to do with making money anymore. It, had, it didn't have anything to do with it. had barrels and barrels and barrels of money. And he was still fucking good with that. Yeah. Right? At that point, it had nothing to do. Where's that crossover point? When did that happen? When 
never happened that, you know, it wasn't about making money, that it was about power, that it was about being you know, about asserting the power. So, and that's what all of us eventually go through. That's all of those stages that you get to. If I get to 175, you know, what's what Walt said? Walt said, I remember the figure, it was like $774,000 or whatever. He just made $774,000 or something like that. That was enough. He made that. But it didn't have anything to do with that. You know, and that's the same journey you go on for most people so when they start training, if they stick with it, is they say, if I can just pinch two plates, two plates in the fucking gym, then I won't feel like such a spaz. If so I can get two plates on the gym, you know, I'm a one plate guy right now, I'm a two plate guy in two years, you know, I won't be such a pussy. But then you get the two plates. What do you look at then? Three plates. Well, three plates. All the big guys do three plates. You know, and then you want three plates. Is it enough for most people to stay in it? No, not. And then what do they want? They become really big guys, really strong guys. They bench four plates, five plates, more. And I want that too. And that's the evolution for most of us that we keep going through. That we, for a lot of us, at some point it comes to an end. Uh, and for some people, it never does. I still talk to guys that wish, you know, that are still lifting, but are past their prime, uh, or, you know, they're not, they know they're not going to get better. Wish, I wish I would have hit this number in. So I wish, I, I don't really, I rarely meet somebody that's content that has, has been lifting for a very long time. And it's that same evolution. It's that as you grow and as you get better, the things that you wanted for before seem so, seem so small and insignificant. So, with you know, the same thing with Walt. Draw the parallel, like I always do. Draw the parallel. With my there. Walt wanted seven hundred and thirty thousand or seven hundred seventy-three thousand dollars with him. But when he got there, there were other things that happened in the journey with that money. The things that happened from the journey. Just making a few bucks, making seven hundred thousand dollars, that changed that influence. So it wasn't about having seven hundred thousand dollars anymore. There was something that happened on the way there that opened his mind to another path or another way or something else that he wanted more. And as we go through our training life and the evolution of those things, those things that happen to us along that road is that we're driving down that road or we're walking down that path or whatever, you know, whatever analogy or metaphor you choose to do. And as we're going down it, we see things change the course of what we want. Our eyes are open to different things that we decide. And that's why a lot of people, when they that have been in lifting or training or whatever for a long time, have a, a lot of these similar stories because they realize once they get to a certain point, they see someone that could do something that they want to do, or they see a body that they want to look more like, or they become far more obsessed with their flaws, and and they basically become obsessed by eliminating the flaw. And once that flaw is eliminated, another one pops up, then another one, and then another one. And now the whole sight of what you were focused on initially that is gone and blurred and destroyed. And that's off somewhere else that you don't even live in. You know, I, I had a friend, um, uh, I used to see him in the gym sometime. And it's one of my favorite stories because I think it defines how this works so perfect. And it was the best shape I'd ever seen him. He was about 225 and I mean, really like, just shredded. I mean, he was big, you know, cut, ripped. He was going on vacation uh, to, uh, I think it was North Carolina, and uh, I said, Roger, I said, dude, you look fucking awesome. Look, this the best I've ever seen you look. He's like, that was all right. I'm like, I'm like, no, dude, you look awesome. I mean, I got, you know, you, you obviously can train hard. You know, you're, you're, you're been on your diet. I mean, dude, you look sweet. He was like, well, you know, I'm going on this vacation. I want to go to this retreat. I'm like, well, you're here ready. And so he's like, eh, he was just kind of, eh, you know, kind of lukewarm about how he felt about himself. And uh, literally a couple of years later, you know, we were we were hanging out. He goes, you know, because I broke out some pictures the other day when I went on that vacation. And it was, dude, that was, that was fucking awesome. Man. I'm like, 
Oh, shit, I told you that. And he's like, he goes, I mean, I really look fucking good. I'm like, yeah, I, I told you that you did. I said it's the best you ever looked. And he just repeated back, that's the best I ever looked. I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm fucking saying to you. <laughs> ever look. And more times than not, more times than not, don't, we're not able to live in the moment. We're not able to see ourselves for what we really are in the present. That is, and that hampers us from accepting the happiness that I talked about earlier. We don't really see what we are right now because we're so busy looking at something off somewhere else, what we could be or what we want to be, that we don't fully know how to appreciate what we what we currently are. And that gets lost so much with guys that they work so hard to reach a certain level. And all that happens is when they get there, all they can think about is what's next. And and that's okay too. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's to keep wanting a little more. But the problem is at what point do you realize you're not gonna get anymore? We don't know that, right? If you don't know when you lose somebody, when's the last time uh, this is gonna be the last time I'll ever hug them? So this will be the last time I ever tell them I love you. So this will be the last time we ever take a car ride. This is the last time we'll be fishing together. But you don't know any of those last times. And you don't really know when it is that this is as good as you're ever going to be. That's a little deep. I know I dropped the No, no, I think that I, it's, <laughs> I, I like it. You know, that's, that's what I kind of wanted to get into with some of this is, you know, all this stuff. And I think, you know, that's a good point of, you know, you, there's nothing wrong with striving to be better. You always want to be better and do better and have these goals and consistently push forward. But it's also being in the now and being happy and accepting, you know, what you've done. Like I, I always, for me is I always, you know, I'm not into the whole new year's thing, whatever. I'm like, it's another day for me. It's almost like my birthdays every year. It's I look back and I'm like, what did I do? Where am I now? What did I come from, from the past year? You know, cause for me it's more personal cause it's my birthday. So I'm like, okay, what did I do? Where am I now? And it's like, wow. You know, like, especially sometimes if I sit and I'm like, fuck, things are going right. Or I got this, I got that. And I sit and I'm like, wow, I, well actually shit ain't actually that bad. You know, it could always be worse, but it, it just kind of brings you into the moment of now you're not worrying about the past, about the future. And it, fucking life's a lot more enjoyable that way. But again, like I said, it doesn't mean you can't strive to do better, or have goals, but it's when you obsess on those, uh, you don't realize you, what you have around you with, whether it's a person or an experience, you know, when people, you see these people that go on vacations and they're too worried about tomorrow and the next day and what's going on. It's like, you realize what's going on around here these guys i'm like you realize like 10 hot chicks just walked by you and were checking you out but you're too busy fucking worrying about some bullshit not enjoying right now i i'm actually the opposite anytime i'm on vacation i'm worried about every minute that's passing because <laughs> i what's gonna go so it's, I, i'm very i'm in fact i'm probably far too aware of that is that if i'm if i'm taking time out or you know i'm in a position where i'm really enjoying myself get that across my mind literally probably every 30 minutes um, because I have had a lot of loss in my life and, uh, I will think about the fact that when I talk about these moments, those really great moments, we don't always appreciate them enough when they're happy. We think yeah. they're what life is about, but we don't appreciate them enough when they're happy. We know we, we, hey, this is cool. This is fun. But I'll often think well, I'm in one of those, like if I'm on vacation or if I'm doing something that I really enjoy, um, I'll often think every minute that's passing is gone. I know that sounds depressing, but I just often think it's not, it's not really, I think about the fact that these moments, they slip away from you. I guess it's more about being self-aware of that moment. And it's about these moments, every minute that goes by, it's gone and you can't, you know, tomorrow things could be awful, it should be terrible. And you need to be very aware and conscious of, uh, that moment when you're in it. Um, one of the things I do, and it sounds really fucking strange, <laughs> is that if, if I'm on vacation, I'll take a moment out when I'm really having a good time and I'll focus on like an object or something. Like I can, like one time I was in Vegas, like it literally still do kind of funny. And there was a statue that 
lived right by where I was laying out by the pool. And I literally just thought about that statue. And I thought about the shape of it. And I thought about the, the you know, how it was made and how it was sitting on the ground and everything. I looked at it for a long time. And I thought about it. And I sort of in, in, entrenched that moment into my mind. And so at this point, it's kind of funny. I could close my eyes and still tell you everything about those few seconds, how it felt, you know, and like I can still remember how the temperature fell in the air and, you know, what the statue looked like. But oftentimes people forget stuff because they don't have a context to assign it. So if you ever talk to a buddy from like a long time ago, and he'll say, you remember when we did this and you fucking don't remember it all? And yeah. Well, you don't have, you know, a contextual reference at that moment. Think about that. How many times I was told this, you ever drive to work and you don't remember the drive in? Or you went on vacation and, you know, like, go on vacation with someone and they're like, do you remember when we did this? And you're like, uh, those are moments that left that you totally forgot about. That we just let go away and life's very fleeting. You can't get those moments back, much less remember them. Yeah. I, that's why I try to tell people it's hard to live in the moment. It's especially hard to live in the moment. All you're thinking about is what tomorrow is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, I, and kind of like something that I've started to do thanks to, you know, one of my friends and, you know, program he's got, um, you know, and I've wrote about him on here before with uh, Brian Grasso. He's, he's got this thing where he's coming out and I've started to do the whole meditation thing. And in one of his programs, he just came out with this whole meditation program of really being in the now, kind of a lot of what we're talking about here and how you saying you focus on an object, his thing. And I started to do it too, whether it's in the moment when you're getting stressed, you're worried about this shit or at the end of the night, you know, when I'm laying in bed and doing some meditation is uh, counting your breaths and that's all you focus on. And it really kind of just shuts out and it brings you into the moment. It's the same very, very similar to like what you're saying, looking at a statue, thinking about it, it's like nothing else is going on except for that. Yeah, it's just about focus on that moment. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't think about that because uh, they let their mind wander so much. You know, they're just having a good time. They're laughing it up. I understand that's a part of life too. But you need to be able to take a time out sometimes when you're in those moments to really focus, you know, just on the moment that you're living in. Yeah. Okay. To be able to do that, the key word there is to focus, and you can't focus if your mind's all over the place. So yeah, and you miss all the shit, like you're saying, that's going by. Like, I can remember another time, like the first time I went overseas, and then I had leave, and I went home, and, and I had a layover in Paris for like 14 hours, and I'm like, fuck, I'm going to take advantage of this. I slept for like two hours at a hotel, left my stuff there, and I'm like, I'm going to, it was like middle of the night, so I got up early in the morning. Like, I'm going to go look at this city. I've never been anywhere outside of the U.S. really to go check it out. And it's like I still remember that whole day and that whole morning because I wasn't worried about anything. Knew, never been to in France, let alone Paris. Didn't know shit about it. And I remember at one point noticing, like, you know, I was hurrying. I'm like, oh, you know, thinking, like, well, I want to do this. I want to do that. And I was kind of not really focusing on what I was doing. And then at one point it just kind of snapped. I was on the uh, on the subway, headed from the airport out into the city, and I was just kind of looking around, and you know, it's like seven, eight o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, I just just focused on that, and I'm like, wow, I'm in a city by myself. I got no fucking clue where I'm going right now, and it was just totally awesome. And it's like even when I think back on it, sometimes you know, it gives me goosebumps of just the feeling that I had. And if I was worried about, okay, well, I got to leave at this time and I want to hit this place, this place, this place, this place, I wouldn't have enjoyed it or had that moment of like, you know what, let me just not worry about it. Let me just focus on now. I'm like, this is an amazing experience that a lot of people say, oh, I wish I could do that. And I'm like, I'm here now doing it. Yeah. And I think the reason why a lot of people end up with such vivid memories about certain things that happen in their life is literally just because of focus, just because something happened to pull their attention so intensely into that moment, into that, those are whether it's a few seconds or a minute, that, you know, that, that it, it leaves such a powerful impression. But the problem is, is that we don't often apply that ability very often for our life. So we miss out on a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. So I think, you know, 
I hope a lot of people, because I've noticed it's made a big difference in my life of just going and experience things. And then just in daily life, you know, when you're worried and stressed about shit, it's like, okay, you know, we're all human, but reminding yourself of that, I mean, counting breaths or focusing on something to just kind of, it, it makes the day better because you're not focused on all this other shit that's going on and tomorrow or yesterday. And it, whether it's with yourself and you're experiencing, or like you said, with other people, it's like, you never know if that's going to be the last time. So it's like, just enjoy it and focus on that moment and just have fun. Yeah. But that's hard for people to do. Very yeah. Hard. Yeah. It definitely, it, and it, it, with everything, it's a process. Shit doesn't happen overnight. Just like writing, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. You're going to have to practice training. It's continual progress. You're going to have to practice, you know, just as you or just as me or just as the top lifters out there, you can ask them, like, I practice every single time I'm doing that lift. I'm always learning and I'm always practicing to be better at it. It's a continual progress. It's, you don't just fucking learn something and you're better at it. The best in the world will still tell you every day I'm learning something new. That's why they're good at it or that's why they came from where they were and they are where they are now. Yeah, the thing about focus, though, is a lot of people have never had it brought to life. They need to learn how to focus on a moment. They need to learn how to uh, inhale, you know, life at, in the present. And a lot of people they don't ever do that because someone either they never tell them how to, or they're just never cognizant of the fact that that ability exists. So you know, that came to me you know, by my own thinking, by my own living, and it comes to some people just in a moment, and they never apply it. Again. So. I mean, that's just kind of another another one of the things that I think about often um, whenever I, like I said, whenever I'm, I'm at a place, good place in life, or even a bad place in life, is to just take a minute out to focus on what it is that I either love about that moment or what it is I want to change. Yeah, I think that's, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, of like if it's in a bad moment, people are like, I don't want to remember this and that, because I used to be that way. You know, when I used to do a lot of drugs, it's like, I fucking hate it. It was a way to get away. And then when I started like, holy shit, look at where I'm at. I don't like this. This is where I want to be. That's when it really kind of started to change. So, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, are going to get a lot of shit out of this, you know, which is going to kind of bring me to, I guess, you know, I know we've been going at this for a while. So to bring me kind of a little bit of a closing question with life and lifting in general, but what are kind of, I was saying earlier, what are, you know, before we start this, what are some of the biggest pieces of advice for guys that are just starting out uh, in the gym, you know, as far as life and lifting goes, or people that have been in there, but really kind of want to step up the bar They're you know, they're in life and in the gym, just kind of floating around and maintaining or whatever the bullshit that they want to give. What are, what are kind of some of the biggest things you can say to them? Um, you know, I always fall back on this because uh, when I did the uh, Juggernaut seminar in Chicago, um, and it was me and Tony Richards, Ed Cohen, Brandon Lilly, um, Taylor Trout, Chad Lemon, Tim Hollis, and it was pretty much along, pretty much everyone that said the same, the one single best piece of advice that we all gave, because that was the last question, was what what would you tell was the biggest piece, or the best piece of advice that you can give someone? And then it applies to everyone. And the, the first one is to be patient. I mean, that, that has to encompass everything that you believe in. If you if you think that you're going to lift, you're going to try to get better. And, and their body said it applies to life. That you need to learn a great deal of patience. Most of the things that you're going to want or desire real desperately are not going to come to you as fast as you want them. So the biggest thing I can say is, number one, be patient. Um, if you're talking about actual training methodology for, for young guys to probably get the gym, I'm, I'm actually doing a, like a series on that, but I'll throw you some bones. <laughs> but that is um, fucking don't do skull crushers ever. Um, I, I didn't I didn't listen. I remember being young and not listening to the old guys because I was like, fuck you old guys. I'm young. I'm awesome. I ain't do skull crushers. just fine. They don't hurt my elbows. Now my elbows are wrecked. Um, don't do skull crushers. Um, uh, the other thing that we talked about this other day on uh, on Alexander's page it was a lot of guys chimed in. It was amazing how many of the older lifters, more experienced guys. When I say older, that's relative. I'm not old. I've just been lifting a long time. But uh, a 
lot of the same movements give a lot of problems. Heavy dips, um, chin ups hurt for a lot of guys, um, overhead pressing at various times. I'm not saying don't do those things. Um, for example, overhead pressing really kills my elbow. But uh, everybody shit on skull crushers, heavy barbell curls. Um, that, that was pretty much the main ones. You want to spare yourself, you know, some of those aches and pains when you're, you're going to be lifting when you're later by holding those now. Focus um, on the longevity, not the in the moment shit. Yeah, and I, I think for a lot of guys, if you're younger and you don't, you're not a very qualified lifter, meaning I e your week, uh, train five or six days a week, squat twice a week, uh, press twice a week, you know, bench one day, incline or overhead one day, uh, and then deadlift once a week. Um, if you're not very strong. You're not going to be able to tax your recovery system very hard. You recover fast. You'll get a lot more practice. You'll get better faster. Learn how to eat to actually gain weight. Uh, there's too many young guys that, that rely on living on uh, creatine or protein shakes uh, and don't know how to eat a lot, a substantial amount of quality food. It, it sucks. I did it for a long time. It sucks to eat a lot of food where you're fucking full all the goddamn time. You're full from your last meal and you're full from the last meal from the meal previous to that too. And then you still have to eat. Yeah. So a lot of guys don't know how to eat. You're going to have to eat a lot more than you think. Um, and basically put a lot of rep work in to grow. Um, a lot of guys want to be fucking YouTube champions now. And like they want to max out every single week. So they don't understand building your mass base for your future. We're going to revolve around doing lots of sets somewhere between like 8 to 12, you know, 8 to 12, 20. Um, want to get, want to build that solid base of mass. You know, the bigger you get, the higher your strength season is going to become. You know, and then those things play into each other. So then after you spend six months or eight months training for mass, you know, you spend the next two months trying to develop your maximum strength. And yeah. You know, a lot of guys don't realize the ebb and flow of that relationship. So, um, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's a million things I could go over for, for young guys, but that's just because one number one, just be patient, learn how to eat, train to be consistent, use quick movements, don't do 14 fucking bicep curls. <laughs> I mean, understand that if you're, you're going to grow through doing stuff like rows, deadlifts, stiff leg deadlifts, squats, front squats, benches, inclines. I mean, getting, you know, you, you take a guy who say that you can only bench 35 or 20, or something and then say, well, I'm going to get you a bench at four or five or 10. You think you're going to be bigger and stronger? Of course, I mean, you're already stronger by the concept of the fact that the numbers are different, but you're going to be significantly bigger, of course. Yeah. You don't need those movements in order to perform. So focus your training around the business, around the basics. Um, I mean, that's pretty much uh, pretty much the ball game. We, like I said, we figured all this shit out 60 years ago and not over the last year. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, like a lot of what you're saying is, is a lot of the same similar stuff to like what I tell a lot of the, the guys coming in, you know, like you're saying, they're doing a lot of this shit they see in these magazines and they're skipping the base, and the basics, you know, and jump into the shit that, you know, it's like these guys have been doing stuff for a long time. You know, I go into the gym all the time and, oh, you know, I just spent a whole day doing arms. It's like, fuck, you just did a bunch of bicep curls and tricep stuff. They're like, yeah, yeah, and I'm like, Fuck, you know, it's the same story over and over and over. So I think, you know, those are, those are perfect. Like I said, you know, patience and dedication is really huge for that. So, you know, I'm glad, you know, thanks for kind of sharing some of that. Um, with that being said, then I know you have stuff coming out. Um, where's the best place for guys to kind of find out these articles, things you're doing. I know lift run bang, especially if they want to get some other stuff for you. I know your Facebook page, has all kind of stuff on it. So I'll put links to everything below this when I post it. Um, but, you know, what are kind of, you know, coming from you the best ways? I mean, the blog's the best place to start. There's a the front bang. Page. I've got, uh, like I said, I've got articles at Juggernaut. I've got articles at Elite FPS. I've got articles at Nation. Okay. Uh, if you do a, a Google search, I should come up pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, if they want to check out some of the older stuff is – Google search it and it'll come up for all of those. Well, and then if you go to the blog. I have, I think I literally have something between 1100 articles. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So for those guys that are looking to this, start, start there and 
work their way through. There's plenty of info. And then like I told everybody there's, you know, on Amazon, you can pick up the, uh, the eBooks. Yeah. And honestly, and I'm, I'm not just saying this, I, I, I don't think I've had a question for a couple of years now that couldn't be answered up something. I wrote things like this. Okay. So I poured almost a year of time into writing that. And there's really not a whole lot. Anytime I get asked a question, uh, it, there's almost always an answer. Perfect. And I know uh, I saw a post the other day on Facebook too, right? You're coming out with a, uh, a new book on just kind of all kinds of shit relationships, all the, which if for people that aren't following you follow, they, everybody should follow you, especially when you make the posts of like, you know, I just took some Ambien and you know, it's time for the crazy <laughs> posts. like I always know like, Oh, okay. Now here comes the good shit. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I'm going to call it um, a meathead's uh, thoughts about live craft relationships stuff and it's just going to kind of encompass uh, all the, the blog posts that I, i've made that have nothing to do with lifting or all the, the facebook statuses that i've written obviously when i'm high only messed up and shit like that and uh and those kind of things because uh you know it's funny because if i well, mike is real sale of renaissance periodization mike's one of my close friends and mike said you know he's like that that's a much better arena to write for he said you write a post about training that's really cool and it gets 20 shares because you write a, a, a post that has to do with you know relationships or just something fun in general and it gets like 300. so it's just a case of like i said writing is my passion and there's only so much we can write about training so i obviously want to venture off into other areas and, and people have asked me for a long time to write a book about these kind of things and i thought about writing it and i thought well i already have it all out there it's just been sitting out there this whole time so i thought to make it easy i would just uh kind of do a, a memoir type thing and just assemble all of this, this information and put it together. And it, it, it'll be funny and serious at times too. You know, and that, that's why I made the one status the other day to kind of have the, you know, something about, it always cracks me up when I hear some woman talk about how sexy their man is when he feels like he fell off the back of a Kentucky Fried Chicken and do a dumpster and was set on fire and beaten out by trolls with vacuum cleaners. I mean, you know, it's just, some people it's amazing to me that some people cannot understand and read that and that it's supposed to be humor yeah but, but it happens yeah people you know there's people out there that are you know get butt hurt or whatever they, fucking they, easy they take their life very very seriously yeah and they're you know it's not gonna be for them whatever it's like okay well i'm having fun so i don't really care if it if it really offends you or not because i'm enjoying it and other people enjoy it because you're not taking it serious it's a joke it's about it funny it's always one person i wrote the, the guy code guy code groups or, or the night just for fun and everybody thought it was hilarious and i think he got i don't know how many shares ended up getting you know, hundreds and hundreds of likes and yet i can't i'm not always those are looking through the shares because i'll be like there's going to be a butler plus person in here somewhere and sure enough i finally found him and it, it doesn't matter how many thousands of people like something what's well, another thing I've, I've really learned is that universally you're never everyone's never going to like one there'll always be someone that fucking hates it yeah how good it is or, or whatever you know i mean if you know it's like there's somebody out there that hates the godfather right that hates that fucking movie. one of the one of them or shawshank redemption you know some of the best movies ever made there'll always be something that goes i hate that fucking movie. yeah yeah or it's like you you know i another example i could see is like you know if there was something of like that was a hundred percent of like read this and you'll become a millionaire in 30 minutes like if it was 100 percent true there would still be somebody that would be like, oh, no, that's fucking bullshit. You know, you're, you're a snake oil salesman. This It's like there's still going to be that person that if it was 100% and there's total proof of it, they'd be like, no, no, uh, that's stupid. Well, I mean, once guys came out and said they didn't think Victoria's Secret models were hot, I just gave up on life at that point. You're never I mean, <laughs> fucking Victoria's Secret models are hot. I'm sorry. You just can't be helped. There's, that's proof right there that, uh, that there's, there's just going to be people that are going to be obstinate for the sake of it. Yeah, no matter what you say, it's just, and that's where a lot of people think like, oh, well, this, it's like, you just fucking ignore it. There's going to be those people and it, they're going to be stuck in their way. So it really doesn't matter why let it bother you, you know, be the master of your domain and don't let them come into it. Be loved or hated, but never ignored. Yeah, exactly. So, all right, cool. Perfect. Well, I know we've got a lot of going on here with this. There's tons and tons of info and all kinds of shit from lifting and a ton of stuff on life. So, you know, it's perfect. It was exactly what I wanted to get done and was looking forward to this. So again, I, I appreciate you taking the time. And um, like I said, I'll post up everything down here for links when I post this up, which will be 
next week because I know it's Friday now. I just had one, so it'll be next week, and I'll post up you know your Facebook and links for everybody to get a hold of you and check your stuff out. Cool, man. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. Again, I you know I, I, again thank you. I've been looking forward to it, and so I'm probably more excited. Always when I do these, I think I'm more excited than anybody else that's going to actually watch them. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Paul. And I, uh, everybody else, look forward to the next features. And if you got any questions or whatever I said, leave them below here. Um, I'll answer them or, you know, shoot them to Paul on his uh, Facebook page or, you know, post them up on his site. Um, I will see you guys soon and uh, I'll talk to you soon, Paul. All right, man. Thanks, Matt. Thanks.